Hi guys, uh, welcome you all. Uh, today our speaker is Dr. Ivan Kukuljan from Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, Gartz in Germany. He is going to speak about uh, correlation spreading in non-equilibrium quantum physics, which is based on his work. Um, thank you, uh, Ivan, for accepting this invitation to give this talk in QSTN forum. And hopefully we can able to learn a lot of things from you. And uh, yeah, this is, by the way, the 83rd talk in the series. So again, thank you for your uh, contribution and you can start. Okay, thanks Sayantan for inviting me. Uh, and I'm really for, looking forward to, um, to uh, well, interact with you. Uh, and, and the group. Um, and also I appreciate a lot uh, uh, that you were willing to stay up so late, probably in India now it's pretty late uh, hour. Uh, so, so yeah, I appreciate that a lot. Um, also, um, just before I begin, um, uh, we were seeing much in the news that India is having hard times now with the epidemics and I'm really hoping that um, the things are gonna improve soon. Uh, and also that the international community uh, is going to be solidary and uh, uh, actually help uh, more than we are helping now. Uh, so, so that would be uh, that would be really that would be really great. Um, unfortunately, also in the recent days, there have been some really sad events on the halfway between our two uh, countries. And although the um, scientific community probably has very very little influence. Uh, I still think that we can probably take the values of Mahatma Gandhi and um, Nelson Mandela, and maybe this helps to that you know the conflict is resolved soon, and that uh, people of both nations can can live in safety and without being threatened to their lives, being taken their homes, or having to face any sort of racial discrimination or apartheid, and basically having their their human dignity and human rights. Um, right, um, so let's begin with physics. Um, so Sayantan asked me to give uh, a more general talk, which I prepared, and then let me know if this, you know, um, if this is, if I'm saying things that you already know, then I can just skip parts of the talk and focus more uh, on, on, on the things uh, which are more specific. Um, so I will be um, presenting the field of non-equilibrium quantum physics. Um, which is a field that has been exploding recently in the last two decades. And there is a lot of interesting activity. Um, and so basically what is it about, right? So um, we all know what quantum physics is and that it's the, uh, the so far most precise description of our world. Um, and of course, to define non-equilibrium, um, we, we, we always define it through equilibrium and equilibrium uh, equilibrium states are such states where there are no currents running in the system. Um, so what we will be interested in today is what happens if you take a quantum system. This is usually going to be a many body system uh, um, uh, consisting of, of usually infinitely many particles um, and you take it out of equilibrium. Um, and then um, we're going to study the dynamics that uh, occurs after, uh, after such an action. And we're going to ask questions like, is the system going to equilibrate? Um, how the correlations are going to be spreading? How the entanglement is going to be growing and so on. Um, and so basically what uh, we're going to be trying to address are the fundamental questions of statistical physics um, through the point of view of, of quantum physics. Um, so that's what the field is about. I, Ivan, I have a question. So mm -hmm. since you mentioned about what do you mean by out of equilibrium? My question is, what is exactly responsible for having a system at out of equilibrium? Uh, yes. What are the reasons and what are the Ex like, influences? Ex exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there are several protocols that people study how to bring the, the state out of uh, equilibrium. Uh, and I'm going to uh, present a few of them uh, in, the, um, in the talk. Um, so just to maybe give a, a tentative answer, um, 
so that you don't have to wait for a couple of slides. So um, one, one possibility would be that you attach your system to some external reservoir, to some external baths. Um, for example, to attach it to, to two baths with two different either temperature or chemical potentials. And then, of course, this is going to drive some current through the system. So that's one possibility. Yes. Another would be to prepare the system in a state which is not an equilibrium state. For example, you, you change some parameter of the system abruptly, mm -hmm. and then this is going to trigger, trigger some interesting dynamics. So, um, so these are, for example, these are two possibilities. We're going to see more of those uh, later in the talk. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, so um, basically, why is the field difficult? So um, uh, as far as I understand, you are all involved with quantum physics. So I don't need to stress that, you know, um, uh, the uh, that uh, the Hilbert space of the of quantum systems grows exponentially with the number of constituents, and that of course makes it um, much more difficult to study than uh, most of the classical systems. Um, and so, if we are doing many body non equilibrium, we are unavoidably facing this uh, facing this problem. And most commonly, we're interested in systems. Um, that uh, are strongly interacting, so we cannot rely on perturbation theory. So there, there have to be different uh, methods to, to solve the problems, um, and most of them uh, being non-perturbative. So that makes the, uh, the field uh, challenging. And then, of course, why is it relevant? Um, now, of course, I'm here I'm presenting uh, many fields of physics that the field is uh, sort of speaking to and um, getting inspired from and trying to contribute to, um, ranging from atomic and nuclear uh, to quantum information, chemistry, and cosmology. Um, and uh, in particular, in the recent days, there are trying to be more and more uh, applications of, uh, of what people do in our field to, to these other, um, uh, other fields. Um, so this is kind of the overview of, of the talk, uh, which uh, I uh, imagine for today. Um, so in the first half of the talk, I want to give, give an overview of the field. Um, and in particular, I would like to start with uh, the methods, which are basically responsible for why the field uh, has developed so much. So, um, um, and you know, since uh, we are physicists. I'm going to begin with uh, a little bit of experiment, uh, experiment, and then a little bit of the theoretical methods, and then present what are the active topics that people are trying to uh, to solve. What are the questions that the people are addressing, or that have been addressing in the recent, let's say, five to ten years. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, um, I would be focusing more narrowly uh, on a topic of spreading of correlations, which is one of the subtopics of the field. Um, where I have been uh, active um, in the recent uh, in the recent times, and um, Sayantan, you'll have to tell me. I was thinking that you know, since um, you asked me to do a two-hour talk, that's maybe a long time for the online talk for the attention it, span. So maybe we can do a five-minute break in between the two halves. Or it is completely on upon you, and like it is not necessarily you have to speak for two hours. I just said. I actually don't want to put any constraint on the speaker. That's why this is two hour, but you can give a one hour talk as well. It is- Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I have prepared stuff for two hours. Just, I was thinking maybe we do a five minute break just because you know, usually like for the Zoom talks, uh, it's like hard to keep uh, paying attention for so long. So at least myself, I appreciate some break after some time, but maybe we can see when we reach the end of the first half, uh, how people are feeling if, you know, uh, we are still energetic enough, then we can just continue. Uh, sure, sure. So let's see. Sure. All right. Perfect. Um, good. Okay. So let's uh, let's have a little bit of an overview of the field. Um, so, um, you know, the field is usually, I mean, when you look at the number of papers that come out, um, you would say it's a rather theoretical field. There's, uh, there's like, <laughs> I have the feeling like 1,000 Theoreticians per one experimentalist. I'm exaggerating a little bit with the order of magnitude, but maybe a hundred per per experimentalist. Um, but still, surprisingly, um, ah, only now you can see my screen. Uh, ha have you been able to see the screen the whole time? 
Yes, it's all fine. Yes. Ah, it's all fine. Okay, okay, perfect. Because I got a message that the participants can now see the screen. Okay, so it was fine, right? Um, so, but surprisingly, it actually turns out that the field was triggered by the experiment. So, uh, so, so there's a lot of reasons for, uh, um, for why to study it coming from the experiment. And mainly it was due to developments in ultra cold atoms um, and in particular optical lat lattices where people can now engineer um, all sorts of Hamiltonians of, in of interest to the theory. And then of course they can also study uh, the non-equilibrium dynamics of such systems. What is important is that the time scales uh, in such systems are much slower than the time scales in real materials. And so it's easier to study the, the transient dynamics that occurs in, in this kind of systems. Um, and, but, but these are not the only type of experiments. There are also experiments with ultra fast lasers um, where people do this kind of pump probe experiments um, where they are able to uh, resolve uh, the signals on the, on the scales of femtoseconds and then actually see the transients uh, also in the, in the real materials. And there are other experiments like superconducting junctions and so on. Um, and you know, recently also we are getting quantum computers, which are also promising a lot uh, on the uh, for the task of simulating uh, many-body quantum uh, Hamiltonians. I will not try to give a complete overview of the experiment, as I'm not an experimentalist. Um, but I would just like to point out two experiments, which are um, particularly uh, in, which I find particularly important. Um, so the first one uh, had an important historic role because it triggered, triggered a lot of theoretical research. That's the quantum Newton's cradle. Um, so the experimental group has uh, a cloud of, um, of a Bose gas of rubidium atoms. Um, and what they do is they prepare it in a non-equilibrium state and then they let it run. Um, and here, um, I think we are observing the, uh, the density of atoms. Um, and as we can see, these are undergoing some, uh, you know, the, cloud, the clouds are moving left and right and they're going, undergoing some um, periodic motion, uh, a bit like the, Newton, uh, the Newton's cradle. Um, and what is interesting here is that um, this, um, uh, these dynamics, uh, um, these oscillatory dynamics hasn't died out uh, even after thousands of collisions. So that was completely unexpected, um, and it triggered a lot of uh, uh, a lot of interest to try to theoretically explain why why this is so. Um, what is important for this system is that uh, the dynamics, uh, so the interaction between uh, the atoms, is integrable point-like uh, collision, uh, and we're going to see later how uh, how this problem was re resolved. Then, um, and another interesting experiment, which is particularly interesting. For me, because I, uh, I'm, um, I'm focusing more on quantum field theory, uh, is the experiment that is going on in Vienna. Um, so again, it's uh, ultra cold atoms. Um, they have developed um, a special magnetic trap where they have been able to generate really amazing um, uh, strands of magnetic field. And so using that, they can trap the atoms in this kind of one dimensional uh, shapes. Um, and they have around 10,000 atoms um, in, the, in the experiment. And so if you look at the microscopic level, um, the, the cloud of atom consists of individual atoms. But then if you look on, a, on scales which are larger than the so-called healing length of the system, um, then the system behaves as a continuum. Um, and it's actually described by quantum field theory. So they can study uh, the Lattinger liquid, which is um, the free boson field theory, um, essentially. Uh, or they can also study interacting field theory, which in this case, the sign Gordon theory, um, and they can do interesting stuff. They can study, they can measure the multipoint correlation functions. They can even study the dynamics uh, and so on. So they can, they're a nice source of, of the experiment for, um, for the theorists um, interested in, uh, in quantum field theory. Um, right, so much about the, uh, the experiments. Um, let me move on to the theoretical methods. Um, Again, it's impossible to give an, uh, in, in a short time an overview of you know, all the methods that occur. Um, I'm going to uh, present, uh, I'm, I'm rather going to present two of the uh, sort of main ones, uh, the, the most commonly used one, and one which is used for field theory. Um, so um, um, probably a big boost to the field was given with the invention of the 
uh, uh, of the DMRG numerical algorithms. So that stands for the density matrix renormalization group. And these are uh, probably the most powerful algorithms that we have at the moment from anybody uh, quantum uh, physics. Um, and uh, so why such uh, algorithms work? The reason is hidden in the so-called the so -called area loss uh, of quantum entanglement. So it turns out that um, if you take uh, uh, ground states of, um, uh, of uh, systems which are only locally interacting, um, then uh, the, the entanglement entropy between uh, a subset and its environment is not uh, proportional to the volume of the set, but only the area dividing uh, the, two, the two sets. So in this two-dimensional case, it will be proportional only to the length of the, of the border between the two sets. And, um, and people have come up with clever algorithms, which um, manage to reduce this high dimension of uh, quantum Hilbert spaces by focusing only on a, uh, so by parametrizing only a corner, a sub corner of the, uh, of the Hilbert space, which is characterized by this, uh, by this um, area uh, law of entanglement. And so um, um, historically the matrix product states um, were the first ones where you can actually parametrize such states. And instead of having exponentially many parameters, um, you are only having polynomially many parameters to encode your, um, to encode your state. Um, mathematically, this relies on the singular value decomposition. Um, and um, so um, apart from the original matrix product states, which are uh, the, the fundament for the DMRG algorithm, uh, people are now studying higher dimensional uh, generalizations or uh, generalizations which enable to study also uh, from formal field theories and I mean systems at, uh, at criticality um, and, and this gives uh, very powerful uh, algorithms um, and this has lots of applications mostly in condensed matter theory um, but also to chemistry um, gauge field theory um, where people have recently also developed tools to study real-time dynamics with gauge field theory um, and um, machine learning, which is a very active topic. So the application of tensor networks for machine learning, where um, uh, they, the methods perform uh, really reach the state of the art for some tasks. Um, but there are also many challenges, um, like computing uh, real-time dynamics to long times, um, uh, to computing, to, to encode states which don't satisfy this area law. Um, or contraction in higher dimensions and so on. And there are also many interesting theoretical mathematical I have questions. A question, Ivan, uh, mm -hmm. regarding this tensor network. So this actually helps you to write down the many body quantum states in terms of uh, small uh, like uh, networks. So exactly, yeah. yeah but uh, exactly why this is important, like why you want to go like that? Because, like, uh, is it not possible to solve a many body quantum, uh, the, like Schrodinger equation or something like that? Right. So, imagine that you want to study um, a strongly interacting system of infinitely many particles, right? So, then, of course, uh, um, if it's strong interaction, you're not going to be able to do perturbation theory. Um, and, of course, you're, you know, um, then you can try to, to, to solve it by some other means. Um, but, you know, if the system is, uh, is non-integrable, um, there's, there's nothing, there's not much left. And then basically, uh, what people can do is exact diagonalization, uh, where you're limited to, uh, finite and actually a small number of particles. I mean, the people do wonders nowadays and really state of the art exact diagonalizations. They're very powerful, but still they're limited to maybe 30 particles or I don't know how what is the record currently reached. Um, so, and the trick here is that you can actually treat uh, uh, infinitely large systems, um, and and the, the sort of um, how it works is hidden actually in this um, in this picture. So, if you wanted to represent uh, a unitary operator, um, uh, or or even more simply a state of let's say um, many qubits. Um, then you would need um, exp an, an, an exponential number of parameters depending on, on your number of qubits. Um, 
However, um, people have realized that you can actually um, decompose uh, such a state into um, a product of matrices, um, which are as many matrices as you have your number of spins. And um, the dimension of, um, uh, and so, so basically what you get is ancillary spins, which connect your two physical spins. So the, the ends, they will be the physical spins. And then you introduce some ancillary. So you represent your state as a product of operators, which, uh, which are contracted along the ancillary spin connecting them. Um, and the uh, dimension of the spin that is connecting them is, uh, is usually called the bond dimension. And, um, and it is related to the entanglement between uh, the two parts of the system. So if I take the one dimension of this system, it's sort of the upper bound for the entanglement of the left part uh, to the right part. And now if my, um, if my entanglement is small enough, then also the, the dimension that I have to take in between the two um, uh, spins, so in my ancillary dimension, uh, is gonna be small. Uh, and this actually, in the end, um, some systems you can treat with the finite bond dimension and you can treat an infinitely large system. So you can actually solve, uh, you can to solve things this, for- to, to write this state, is there an assumption that the system is closed and uh, always has to be unitary? Because like once you consider open quantum systems where you have uh, some interaction with the bath or something like that uh, in the environment, then also possible to write this kind of states where we know that sometimes states are not unitary if you consider open quantum systems. Yes, exactly. So um, in the in the open setting, um, it becomes more complicated. And then, of course, you have to treat the system at a super, opera super operator uh, level. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think people also do DMRG for uh, open uh, for open systems. So I think they they are able to simulate. But uh, but I'm, I'm so I'm not sure about this. Uh, I mean about uh, about this particular detail. Um, but yeah, so but most commonly it's done for for uh, for open boundary. I mean for for you know for a closed system. So you have some boundary condition which you have to encode uh, and so on. Um, yeah, and how this is uh, related and helpful to understand uh, machine learning problem? Could you please explain a bit more? Right. So um, so what people do there is um, they. Uh, encode, uh, so they first do an embedding of classical data into a Hilbert space. So there are different maps. I mean, there are different choices how, how you can do that. And it usually it amounts to a bit of engineering to choose the best way to do it. Um, and then basically uh, you can um, encode, so you can basically do your optimization on the level of tensor network. So you take a more complicated tensor network um, and then in, in cases where the data, uh, the, the, the data, the classical data that you want to study um, obeys, has some nice uh, properties, uh, which are you know, closely related to, to the entanglement uh, properties. So usually you need that the mutual information of, of a subsystem is not too large. Uh, I mean, the mutual information between a subsystem and the rest. Um, and then it turns out that this kind of um, tensor networks or uh, how they're also called tensor trains, um, are, are very efficient to uh, to encode. Uh, yeah, but to I have asked this um, the other thing that people also use them for uh, is compressing uh, the um, the learned uh, parameters of a uh, of a machine learning of a of a complicated um, neural network, uh, and then it turns out that you can use this kind of uh, methods to compress those uh, parameters quite efficiently. And so then it's faster. I mean, it's, then it's they take less space to store. Um, yeah, I so. actually asked because of this neural network story because uh, I believe that people are like using more frequently this idea there in the quantum neural networks and. Um, yeah. So so yeah. So I mean, you would use a tensor network uh, as a replacement for a neural network. Yeah. You can use that, or also in a combination with a neural network. I mean, there are many things that are being uh, that are being done. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's it's it's an emerging field, and it's very interesting. There's a lot of development uh, going on. Of course, people also use 
uh, neural networks to solve uh, problems on the quantum side. Uh, that's okay. that's also going on. Um, and then, you know, there are different opinions on what, what is the potential of this and so on. But yeah, this, this I mean, there's it's an active field of research. Um, right. So let me move on. Um, and so, so the you know on on the algorithmic side, um, we have the tensor networks and also other methods. I mean, which which I'm, I'm skipping for the lack of time. Um, but on the theory side, the probably most um, powerful tools that we have and that have caused a lot of development is through the integrability theory. Um, and uh, so I believe uh, you might be uh, you might be familiar with that. Um, so basically, if you take a special class of systems that have certain, you know, certain uh, nice uh, um, uh, properties, um, then it turns out that you can actually solve them exactly, although they are strongly interacting and uh, uh, infinitely consist of, and thermodynamically large, so consisting on infinitely many uh, particles. Um, the key to that is the elastic scattering of quasi-particles. Um, encoded in the Young-Baxter equation, which basically tells you that um, the, if, you're, if three particles are scattering, the order in which they scatter uh, doesn't matter. And so if the system satisfies this property, um, then it turns out that there are infinitely many conserved charges. Um, and this uh, gives rise to exact solvability of such a system. Um, and uh, so they ha that has been uh, discovered already a while ago in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, but uh, recently, people started using integrability theory to also solve out of equilibrium uh, problems. Um, and, um, you know, traditionally, people were most interested in the spectra or some uh, uh, equilibrium uh, characteristics of the system. But now we can also study uh, the non equilibrium time evolution. On the field theory side, people have used uh, conformal field theory quite a lot, uh, which is. Um, Another example where you can uh, solve your uh, uh, your system exactly, and the S matrix uh, bootstrap um, uh, methodology. Um, the problem is, of course, that um, uh, integrability theory only works in dimension one. I mean, for for quantum systems, for classical, for two D, it works for a narrow set of models, and usually also the behavior of integrable systems is quite different from the uh, non-integrable system. So the result that you get uh, through integrability is then not going to be generally valid. Um, and so these are some of the, uh, of the challenges. Um, and in particular also, for example, um, it's very hard to compute higher order correlation functions through uh, integrability theory. So there are results for one point correlation functions, but two point correlation functions, for example, are only recently being to uh, there. Well, there are some small steps in that direction, and it's, the problem is very, uh, very hard. Um, so on the uh, field theory side, um, again, I'm I'm neglecting many uh, many nice methods um, that are uh, um, that are around. Um, but an interesting method that is, turns out to be very useful. Um, uh, and has not yet been exploited enough. So simply because there are just few groups doing it is the so-called truncation, uh, truncated conformal space approach or more generally, more generally truncated Hamiltonian approaches. Um, so these are numerical methods for strongly coupled QFT. Um, and, um, and they're based on uh, conformal field theory and, and sort of renormalization group uh, ideas. Um, and they're nice because they don't need a discretization of uh, space. So unlike the lattice QCD, uh, where you need to discretize your space and time um, for uh, truncated for the TCSA, uh, you don't need to do that. So you can study the system directly um, in the continuum. Um, and how it works is um, you basically view your uh, theory um, as a point along the um, uh, RG flow away from the fixed point. Uh, and you represent it as the, um, uh, so you represent the Hamiltonian uh, as the fixed point uh, CFT Hamiltonian plus some perturbation. Um, and uh, you express your, um, your Hamiltonian in the, in the conformal field theory basis of the, uh, of the CFT part. Um, and then basically by introducing an energy cutoff, so you introduce some high energy cutoff, 
um, you get a finite uh, Hilbert subspace. Um, and if you're studying uh, properties which uh, are um, which are uh, low energy properties of your system, um, then this method is very efficient, and you can study many things um, like the spectra sp spreading of correlation functions. You can study all sorts of states from thermal to excited. You can study real time dynamics, um, quantum chaos, and so on. Um, so in principle, um, this would work in any dimension, but of course. Uh, the dimensionality grows uh, very rapidly if you, I mean, the dimensionality of the Hilbert space uh, grows very rapidly if you go to higher uh, space dimensions. Um, and so the method has been efficiently applied in dimension one plus one and, and two plus one, so two space and one time dimension. Um, uh, right. Um, so, um, as I said, I, I skipped many interesting theoretical methods. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I cannot cover everything. Um, uh, and let us now look um, at the what are these active topics um, in the field. Um, so please let me know also if I'm telling things that you already know. Um, so uh, I, I don't know what your uh, expertise are. Um, and so we can just uh, skip some things if they are already familiar. Um, so. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple of uh, sort of topics that have been researched very actively recently. Um, and uh, so let's begin with, with perhaps the most um, you know, paradigmatic question of non-equilibrium, which is transport, right? So uh, as we define the equilibrium is, you know, uh, an equilibrium system is a system without currents. And so if you introduce a non-equilibrium, then you're going to have some uh, currents running through your system. Uh, and, you know, uh, historically, um, this question uh, became very, very important uh, through superconductivity and so on. Um, and also a lot of these developments were motivated by superconductivity. Unfortunately, it turns out that they're not going to, they don't have the potential to provide any answer to superconductivity. Um, but still, there, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, development that happened. Um, so, um, through um, in exact solutions using integrability and also matrix product states, because you can use matrix product states, not just as a numerical method, but also as an analytic ansatz. Um, people have been able to study uh, the um, transport in uh, strongly interacting uh, spin chains. And interesting, interestingly, the spin chains can have um, not only the dissipative then, uh, transport, so, um, um, uh, so basically, uh, the um, that would be a transport where your current is proportional to the um, um, proportional to the difference between the two potentials. Um, but they can also have uh, the ballistic transport. So there's basically a transport without any losses, um, and this is characterized by the so-called Drude weight, which gives um, the um, the singular part of the um, of the conductivity, um, and uh, using uh, this kind of um, integrability approaches, people have been able to demonstrate that indeed uh, quantum spin chains can have this dissipationless uh, transport um, and and basically compute the lower bound uh, for the Drude weight uh, in that case. Um, going back to, to your question of open systems, that's something that has been studied also a lot. In this case, open systems have been used as uh, a protocol to actually generate non-equilibrium uh, dynamics. So um, what people do is uh, they take a spin chain and they introduce uh, some Lindblad operators. Uh, so they introduce some uh, driving of the system at the edges. So this is equivalent to the system being attached to some thermal or reservoirs or, or some chemical potentials at the, at the boundaries. Um, and then this generates uh, currents through the system. Um, the idea is to study the transport properties of the system in the bulk. Um, so, so for this reason, the, the Lindblad operators are only introduced at the boundary so that you don't disturb the, the bulk of the system. Um, and in some, uh, some particular cases, um, you, it is possible to solve such, um, such a dynamics exactly. Um, and uh, and and then basically people get exact results about the transport properties 
uh, of I, the I system. I have a question. So to construct this lean blood end, is there an assumption like non-Markovianity or Markovianity in the system you are considering? Um, well, there's a Markovianity assumption of the bath, um, but the system you just take uh, the the, the uh, some of the standard uh, integrable uh, quantum Hamiltonians, for example, the Heisenberg XXZ chain or so on, that has been like the canonical example. Um, so, 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 you know, in the bulk, you actually have the unitary dynamics and you have the, the sort of open dynamics or, you know, the Limbladians are really just acting at the boundary, usually just at the first and the last spin uh, of the chain. Um, okay. Uh, so that's how, so also like with these uh, uh, slides, I'm listing here uh, some references. These are not, uh, these are usually not gonna be the, first paper where it is done, but these are usually review papers where um, um, where you can have a, like a sort of more condensed uh, overview of the of the field. So in particular, the first one would be covering the uh, the open systems. Um, so the, the first solutions came through the through the matrix product states. So through these tensor network uh, uh, techniques. Um, and then more recently, there was uh, there have been a nice method uh developed called under the name generalized hydrodynamics um where um people have observed that basically you can take the hydrodynamic uh, the, the classical hydrodynamic equations and if you correct them for the um uh for the contributions uh, coming through the interaction between the particles which uh in turn you can uh, compute through integrability theory um then you can get um a macroscopic description of your system for the for non-equilibrium situations uh, and then people can use that to study transport so this has this has been uh one i mean this has been a very very nice uh development and again um the second paper will give a nice uh will give a nice overview uh, of the field so basically the inputs are the the corrected velocities of the, of the quasi particles which are corrected because of the uh, the interaction uh between the particles Right, let's move on. Um, um, a very, so Sayantan, can I just ask you, what is the background of the group? Are you more high energy or more condensed matter? It's mixed actually. So I, I would prefer, I am actually giving the full freedom to you and uh, mm -hmm. you proceed because otherwise you will feel uh, like a little bit, because yeah, like some people from high energy, some people doing condensed matter. So it's like mixed. So yeah, like, you choose according to your way. All right, cool. No, I was just I was just thinking to you know to, to know a bit more what things to introduce a bit more and what things are more uh, like uh, you know uh, the, the general background already of the of the people in the audience. Okay, I'm, well I'm just gonna go on the way I'm doing it and then just stop me. I mean I think this is the best if you ask questions and um, and and I try to uh, to answer. So um, entanglement dynamics is a topic which is probably familiar to. Uh, to people from both of the fields, condensed matter and high energy, um, since the entanglement is, you know, um, one of the essential features of quantum systems, perhaps uh, the most, um, the most of quantum of all uh, properties, um, and uh, uh, there have been a lot of um, papers also on the dynamics uh, of entanglement uh, in non-equilibrium situations and so on. Um, most notably, perhaps results by Cardi and Calabrese, uh, who have been able to uh, solve the problem using uh, exactly using conformal field theory. And then they have been able to demonstrate this nice result um, that the growth of uh, uh, entanglement is connected to the central search of the theory and so on. Um, and they have developed this nice uh, replica trick uh, calculation uh, for, the, uh, for the entanglement entropy uh, in CFT. Um, um, and um, Recently, there's still a lot of interest interest in the topic. One is coming through the um, generalization of entanglement to mixed states because we know that it only works for pure states, uh, and for mixed states, you need other concepts. Um, and also importantly, because this has a lot of uh, implication to for tensor network algorithms. Uh, as I said, they rely on the on the area laws of entanglement, um, and so if you want to extend the application of tensor networks. Uh, also, if you know, uh, if you want to extend them to, to machine learning tasks and so on, you have to understand these uh, entangling uh, uh, properties. 
or or the well, more generally information theoretic properties of of the data that you want to uh, apply in that case is classical data so it's not entanglement but it's still the informa information theoretical properties um so there has been a lot of uh, activity uh, around that um and perhaps now we're reaching the sort of um block of the most important uh, questions that are being asked um, in the field uh, and that that's connected to the equilibration of the system so um let's say we prepare our system in a non-equilibrium state so a state which is not uh, a ground state or a thermal state or an excited state of the system um and then we let the system evolve so is such a is such a situation going to lead to an equilibrium uh, or not um, and of course we all know that quantum dynamics is unitary so uh, it's recurrent um, if we wait long enough the system is going to return to the um, to the initial state um, and if we have uh, small quantum systems then this recurrence is of course the the recurrence is going to happen in the um, time to infinity limit so we we're going to have to wait infinitely long for it um, um but you know it's eventually going to happen uh, on the contrary in the macroscopic world we know that the matter always thermalizes um and that um the the the, uh, the matter reaches some state with maximum entropy ensembles um and so the question is how these two fit together this is basically the question of quantum uh, statistical um, physics. Um, and people are trying to uh, explain this, so to, to answer this question for uh, infinitely large systems, so with a number of particles going to uh, infinity. Um, the sort of uh, current understanding is that if you look at the subsystem of your system, then um, the rest of the system, so in this case, you noted with red color, um, is going to add as, act as thermal beds to the system. And so the, 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 like the small part of the system is going to feel like it's an open system connected to some, um, some external beds. And in fact, you could also model this as a, you know, um, with some Liouvillean dynamics. Um, and um, sort of the answer to the question is, uh, do systems thermalize? So um, if you want to understand whether uh, 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 the time evolution of a system from a non-equilibrium state is going to lead um, to the Gibbs ensemble uh, globally. The answer is globally not, but if you look locally, so for any observable defined on a you know finite support, um, then uh, in the uh, in the long time limit, um, the um, uh, the expectation value of the observable is going to be equal to the thermal expectation value of that observable locally. So, um, so even though the system is not going to reach an, an equilibrium ensemble locally for all observables, that's going to be the case. So that's kind of the understanding. Um, but of course, that remains so. So that remains unproven. So that's still it's a con I mean it's a conjecture. People have seen that uh, uh, for many systems where they have been able to compute it, but uh, to prove it like fully rigorously mathematically, it remains an open problem. Uh, particularly interesting is what happens for integrable systems. Um, in that case, it turns out that the system doesn't just have a single temperature, but there is a temperature associated to any to to every uh, conserved uh, charge, to every conserved quantity, and the system has infinitely many. So basically, to to specify the maximum entropy uh, state of an integrable system. You need to specify infinitely many temperatures, and for this reason, um, the system is going to have a memory of the initial state because you know the the, the temperatures of the um, uh, corresponding to every charge is going to depend what is the initial state that you prepare your system in, um, and that basically explains the the experiment that that I mentioned before, uh, where people have seen that the oscillations don't die out. So basically, this is an integrable system. And it has a memory of the uh, of the initial state. Um, so that's also one of the um, uh, one of the reasons also why integrable systems are very different from from generic systems. So generic systems just have uh, a single conserved uh, quantity, which is the the Hamiltonian, the energy, um, and so they they also they also have just one temperature, um, and they're gonna forget about the uh, initial state. Um, and of course, to prove GGE generally is also 
so still an open uh, an open question and probably a very I mean indefinitely a, a very hard one. Um, right. So, so f f um, sorry for this. Um, well, I guess it's uh, eigenstate stabilization hypothesis. Uh, what's underlying this? Um, th does that make any assumption already on the entanglement uh, structure uh, of the system, or is it uh, somewhat independent from from that? Um, right. So yeah, we're actually just going to reach the eigenstate stabilization hypothesis very soon. Um, um, right. So, so you know, this is a. I mean, it's very closely connected to to the thermalization, right? So if you can prove the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then you can, of course, you're going to prove that. The system is thermalized, um, and uh, so um, of course, and if you have an integrable system, then the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is not gonna uh, is not gonna hold. So basically, you need you need kind of uh, you need ergodicity. You need you need some level of chaos in your uh, in your system. Um, so so basically, the uh, uh, the thermalization is, you know, intimately related to um, to ergodicity. So basically, is the system going to explore all the phase space that is available to it or not? That's in the classical case. Um, and of course, classically, we understand that through through chaos, right? So chaos in the classical case means that if you take um, two neighboring trajectories, they're gonna uh, diverge exponentially uh, in chaotic systems, um, and um, of course, um, uh, people wanted to understand also what what is the correct way to understand this um, in the uh, in the quantum setting, um, and um, there has that has been a very active research field in the 80s and 90s, and recently it has reemerged again. So at the moment, is again a very active um, field. Um, namely, the problem comes from the fact that um, in the quantum case, uh, we don't have a notion of trajectories. Um, so it's impossible, and also the quantum systems are, you know, the, uh, the dynamics is unitary, so it's impossible for the system to go exponentially far away from uh, where it started. Um, and, and then people have tried to find different ways to characterize uh, chaos in the quantum uh, case and to understand, and then of course this would be a key also to the uh, thermalization properties of, of the system. Um, and uh, uh, sort of the most uh, rigor, I mean, the, the most solid way to, uh, um, uh, to characterize chaos comes through the quantum chaos conjecture, uh, which tells you that um, uh, the spectra of uh, quantum chaotic systems um, have the statistical properties uh, of, random, of random matrix theory ensembles. Um, um, so, um, and in particular, the conjecture was I mean, it's more precisely for the systems that have a semi-classical limit, then um, their, uh, uh, their spectrum is going to follow a random matrix theory ensemble. Um, and so that's kind of in the quantum, at least traditional quantum chaos community, uh, considered as the only possible way to characterize chaos. Um, recently, and, and of course, historically, there have been many attempts to characterize quantum chaos through dynamical, um, uh, dynam dynamical means. Uh, in particular, objects, I mean, uh, uh, objects like the Loschmidt echo and so on. Um, but uh, none of them have, uh, have, been, have managed to fulfill all the criteria. And recently, there was a, a, a new proposal, which are the out of time ordered correlators, but which for sure you, uh, you noticed, um, that have been proposed by Kita Ayev and basically uh, have been motivated by. Uh, um, by, by, by Soviet papers from the 60s, um, where they have, so the, they have proposed to, to look at uh, objects where you're looking at four point correlation functions, where the operators um, appearing in the, uh, um, appearing in the uh, correlator um, are not all taken at the same time. So basically this is out of time ordered. If you expand this uh, commutator, you're, you're going to see that you're going to get an operator at time zero, and then you're going to go to some uh, future time, and then coming back to zero. Um, and for um, uh, for scattering of electrons and impurities in the superconducting theory, this turns out that it was related to the uh, Lyapunov exponent, basically of the system. And so this has, so basically this proposal uh, in the in the recent times. Um, has triggered a lot of renewed interest in, in quantum chaos, um, in particular on the high energy side, because uh, people have been able to 
uh, compute this uh, for a system that have a holographic dual, and then it was important for the study of black holes and so on. Um, and uh, but it has also re-triggered the uh, the interest in the condensed matter uh, on the condensed matter uh, side. Um, and in particular, also I, recently, there have been the, first results. Uh, I just have a point. In random matrix theory, we usually look for spectral form factors. So you want to mean that exactly. spectral form factors are somehow related to the out of time ordered correlators. Well, so so yeah, so that's a bit of a uh, of a controversial topic. Um, so um, so um, there have been some examples uh, where uh, people have shown that um, you know they have computed spectral form factors for systems with exponentially growing uh, out of time order correlators. So in those cases, uh, uh, they, uh, the the two uh, measures sort of matched, um, but it is somehow understood that actually those are uh, in, and there were other cases where basically the two uh, the two measures disagree for example you can simply take um, any of the you know canonical quantum chaos models um, from you know um, from from the book of fritz hake let's say and, and compute the out of time order correlators and you're going to see that you don't get an exponential growth right so um, so, so it is kind of understood that there are two, just different, two different approaches to, to chaos at the moment. Um, there has been some interplay, but also it seems that um, the communities are not talking to each other as much as they could or should. Um, one of the reasons is that um, the, uh, the sort of more traditional quantum chaos community um, has already, well, many of the researchers have retired already. Uh, and so on, um, but also um, there hasn't there there seems that there hasn't been so much interest also on the high energy side to uh, to connect to the uh, to the more random matrix theory approach to to, to chaos. Also, um, but I that... just want to make a point for random matrix theory. Probably this identification is very clear for Gaussian unitary ensembles, but for the other type of ensembles like circular symplectic ensemble or maybe some other type of ensemble this identification is not very clear at all till now i think because like yeah you mean you mean the identification with uh sorry with uh out of time order correlators right yeah i i don't i mean yeah i must say i don't know i mean i haven't been following this development so so closely so so i i, I wouldn't know what the you know what the state of the art is at the moment um, um, so I was following the, the field uh, when it appeared uh, a little bit, but then of course, by, I mean, my, my research is in a different direction, so I, so I won't be able to tell you what is exactly state of the art uh, uh, at the moment. Um, so, um, but also interestingly, you know, um, uh, on the sort of random matrix theory side of uh, approach to chaos, um, there have been nice developments where people have been able to compute the spectral form factors for many body uh, systems. So these were the big breakthroughs because it's a very hard problem. You know, if you have a, uh, have a many body chaotic system, it's not gonna be integrable. And then uh, it's hard to compute something analytically. And, and there have, you know, in this case, they have found the ways to, uh, to compute uh, um, the spectral form factor for a many body system. So that was a nice, um, a nice breakthrough. Um, so, so there's yeah, there's probably still a lot of room for uh, for development uh, here um, uh, in this area. Um, all right, and and then you know combining these two things, the uh, the chaos and the um, thermalization naturally leads us to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis um, by Srednitsky and Deutsch, um, and um, you know um, it's a hypothesis basically telling us that. Um, if we take the expectation value uh, of the uh, observable between some eigenstates of the system, then it's basically going to agree with the microcanonical, essentially going to agree with the microcanonical expectation value uh, of the observable. Um, or, you know, um, more generally, you can, you know, express the um, um, the spectrum of a uh, of an observable, um, and again, you're going to have some diagonal time uh, part, which is uh, behaves microcanonically, and then 
um, and then some uh, off diagonal part which is connected to uh, some random matrix uh, ensemble. Um, and so if uh, um, if we are able if we are someday able to prove this hypothesis, um, then of course we have answered the uh, normalization problem and um, and you know the ETH is also very important to um, to gravitational physics and so on. Um, so so yeah, it's one of the one of the big open uh, problems uh, in the field. Um, right. Um, and also recently, uh, what has been a very hot topic uh, is the many body localization. So um, uh, people have noticed that there's a different way to avoid thermalization um, in, in many body systems, and that's through disorder. Um, so if you, you know, in this case, um, uh, it's an XXZ model where they introduce an external magnetic field, which is disordered. So they, um, the field is chosen randomly at every um, lattice point. Uh, spacing and then you know and then it's average over um, uh, an ensemble of generalization uh, generations of this disorder um, and um, it turns out that such systems can basically the disorder can um, force the uh, particles to uh, localize and then such a system is not uh, thermalizing basically and also um, the, the entanglement uh, doesn't follow a volume law but it follows um, an area law and interestingly, um, such systems have uh, emergent uh, integrability. Um, and that's a huge field, so I'm not trying to cover it all because you know they're, they're dedicated uh, dedicated conferences uh, just for the uh, for the field. That's one of the nice reviews, but there's several others too. Um, um, one of the problems here is that most of the results come through the exact diagonalization so that um, things have been only computed for small system sizes. Uh, and so uh, it is not really clear uh, if, uh, um, if the many body uh, localized phase is really there in the thermodynamic uh, limit. And uh, there have also been uh, recent results where, um, where people uh, argue using um, random matrix theory uh, arguments that, uh, that, that that shouldn't be the case. Um, right. Um, but you know it's a controversial, uh, controversial uh, uh, thing, um, and and then there are more um, sort of uh, dynamic theory uh, approaches to, to questions. So um, so the more formal um, more mathematical approaches. Um, we know that in classical integrability theory, the classical systems which are integrable, which are exactly solvable. Um, then um, the trajectories for, uh, form uh, tori in the phase space, um, the so-called Liouville, uh, Liouville tori. Um, and there's a nice theorem, the kolmogorov arlord moser theorem, which says that such tori are stable uh, to, um, to small perturbations of the system. So if the perturbation is small enough, then these tori are going to be deformed, but they are, um, they're not going to completely, you know, uh, um, they're still going to preserve uh, the form. Um, and that's like one of the open questions uh, for quantum dynamical systems is, um, um, is quantum integrability also uh, stable under uh, small uh, perturbations? Um, sorry. Um, and uh, there have recently been two interesting answers to this, uh, to this question. Uh, um, one of them, the pre-thermalization. So people have noticed that um, if you study the non-equilibrium uh, non dynamics of a system, which is almost integrable, so it's just integrable, but slightly perturbed, um, then um, the dynamics of the system is going to, for a while, stay um, close to a state which, which is close to the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the integrable system. So it's going to, you know, uh, notice some... Um, some effects of integrability, but then eventually at, at later time, uh, it's going to thermalize to a Gibbs ensemble, so to a thermal state. So, um, so basically, you're going to have some transient, um, well, some pre term, it's called pre thermalization, some transient uh, uh, um, effect where, uh, where the integrability properties are uh, sort of uh, noticed by such a dynamics. And a different, um, a different sort of answer to that comes through, through quantum scars, which are also recently. Uh, very very active topic 
um, well, where people have noticed that um, you know a bit like the classical systems which have the um, uh, the uh, islands of integrable uh, dynamics and then the, the the chaotic sea around them uh, quantum system some certain quantum systems uh, also have um, particular uh, um, particular states for which the uh, the, the dynamics is uh, is, bit, is is regular, while the rest can be you know uh, chaotic. Um, right. Okay. So here I would kind of like to conclude with the um, overview of uh, some of the uh, important topics that were uh, that have been active recently, and I would like to move on to the um, more to be more narrow to the spreading of correlations. Um, so, um, are there still any questions? Are we feeling uh, tired? Do we need a break or do we just continue? From my side, you can continue. Please ask the other people. We can continue. Okay, perfect. Then I continue. Um, great. Um, right. Okay. So now I'm focusing more narrowly on the topic of spreading of correlations, which uh, has uh, also received a lot of attention uh, recently. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce the protocol of quantum quenches. Um, so that's, you know, I've already touched it a little bit in uh, the answer to your question in the beginning. Um, so how do we bring uh, a system out of equilibrium? So one possibility is to prepare the system uh, in the ground state, let's say, or a thermal state of some Hamiltonian, um, and then abruptly change some parameter of the Hamiltonian. Um, this is called a quantum quench. And of course, the, um, the initial state is not long, no longer going to be an equilibrium state of the post quench Hamiltonian. Um, and it's going to trigger um, some interesting dynamics of the system. Um, and then there are many questions that we can ask uh, related to these dynamics. You know, we could ask, does it equilibrate and so on. Um, and uh, uh, so, and of course, uh, more generally, we can also uh, engineer the state in a different way. It doesn't have to be a ground state of a Hamiltonian. Um, people take new states or, you know, uh, states which have certain nice properties so that they can compute them. Um, so these are quantum questions. Uh, questions and uh, that's a protocol that has been uh, studied uh, a lot. Um, one of the uh, aspects that you can study related to quantum questions is how the correlations are, are spreading through the system. Um, and um, um, most notably, um, uh, there has been the so-called horizon bound, which was proposed uh, to hold for uh, for quantum quenches by, by Cardi and Calabrese. Um, so it says the following. So if you prepare your initial state, so that would be, in this case, uh, our x-axis is the space and the y-axis is the, the time. If you prepare your initial state to um, be short range correlated, um, to have exponentially decaying correlations, um, then um, uh, basically, uh, and, and, and so, and then you're, you're studying the spreading of these correlations. Um, what you expect to see is that these correlations are going to be spreading within uh, a light cone. This is because um, sort of the intuitive picture is that um, the correlations are being spread by pairs of quasi-particles, which are generated in initially correlated regions and travel to opposite directions. And because these um, quasi-particles can travel at most at the speed of light, um, then also the correlations cannot travel uh, cannot be spreading faster than uh, the speed of light. Um, and, um, and this is indeed what you observe. So that, that's, for, in this case, is for the Klein-Gordon field theory. Um, so you have a nice uh, light cone spreading of the correlations. Um, and you can still have some exponential tails outside of the light cone, which uh, just simply originate from the, uh, from the initial uh, exponential tails of the correlations. Um, so that's the so that's basically uh, and this sort of uh, uh, characteristic length of these tails is called the horizon thickness. So that's basically what horizon bound uh, uh, tells us. Um, and um, and this has been you know this has been uh, proven rigorously in conformal field theory, and it's easy to show in in uh, free uh, for free systems. Um, in lattice systems, this is uh, kind of implied by the Lee Robinson uh, bound. Um, uh, and um, it has been verified um, uh, theoretically in, 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 many, in, in many systems by 
uh, by either numerical or analytical calculations. Um, and it has also been measured uh, experimentally. Um, uh, in, and so for these reasons, um, this has commonly be, been accepted um, to be a general property uh, of quantum systems, uh, the horizon spreading of correlations. A, a question for that. So uh, if one starts with a critical state, so with already infinite uh, correlation or uh, correlation length, then does it also hold? Uh, the... um, no, of course not. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, no, it's uh, then it's not going to hold. Uh, basically, what you're going to get is you're going to have um, also algebraically decaying tails uh, outside of the of the light cone. So the sort of condition is that you start with um, with a with a with a gapped state, basically that you have some finite uh, correlations. Um, so this is the easiest to see in the case of uh, free theory. So if you do a quench to a free theory, where you see that basically your time evolution is going to be uh, a convolution of your initial correlations with some propagators, and so if you're convolving, uh, if you're convolving uh, algebraically decaying correlations, you're going. This is going to you know be kept at later times so so then you're not going to see the uh, um, the effect but also um you know to violate the horizon bound or i mean to, to find an example where it violates you you need to start with uh with uh, with a gap state um right and uh so we were interested um you know because on the field theory uh side there were mostly solutions for free systems um we were interested in what happens um uh, to uh, to the cor uh, correlation spreading uh, in case of interaction. So how does the interaction actually affect uh, the correlation spreading? Um, and we focused on the particular uh, QFT, the uh, Sam Gordon model, um, which uh, has certain nice properties that were the reason that uh, why we chose it. Uh, so um, most importantly, uh, the uh, the theory is um, integrable. Um, and so, um, so you know, there, you know, there are uh, results around. Um, so uh, the model is important because um, it's, you know, the simplest model, which is kind of solvable, um, that still keeps the properties of uh, of strong interaction and of uh, more uh, more complicated theories. In particular, um, it's the sort of most simple model of uh, um, of confinement and so on. Um, so uh, the model, um, uh, you know, the, the model is basically the free, um, the free boson theory plus uh, a cosine uh, interaction term, um, and the cosine interaction term has uh, infinitely many uh, minima, and this gives rise to to field configurations which can interpolate from one minimum to the other, which is sort of the the classic uh, the quantum version of uh, the of the solid ones that the classical uh, theory. Uh, has opa sorry um, and uh, um, and depending on the values of the uh, of the parameters of the model um, the solitons can have either repulsive or attracting uh, interaction um, and if their uh, interaction is uh, attractive then uh, the solitons form bound states uh, breeders um, and um, so this gives rise to an interesting phase diagram where you have a region. Uh, where the breeders exist, the so-called attractive regime, and then the region where there is no breeders, the repulsive regime. Um, then you have the uh, costal stauless phase transition um, to, um, to basically a, weak, a weakly coupled um, region. Um, and in between the regions, um, the theory is equivalent to the free, uh, to the free fermions. Um, so we, we took a look at this, um, uh, this system. Um, because it is at the moment not yet possible to compute two point correlation functions using integrability, we decided to study it uh, with the truncated conformal space approach numerics that I presented um, before. Um, so, that numerical method for, for quantum field theories. Um, and we saw an interesting surprise. So, um, basically, um, these are the results. So, the top line is for the time Gordon field theory. Um, and basically, we're studying again the x uh, axis is the space and y axis is the time direction, and we're studying the spreading of correlation. So we see that for the Klein Gordon theory, uh, we get uh, a nice uh, light cone uh, the way one would expect. Um, in the San Gordon case, 
um, if the interaction is uh, small. Um, this delta is basically um, related to, to beta square. So it's beta square, I have it here, beta square divided by eight pi. So if the interaction is small, then the sine Gordon theory also has a light cone. But then if you're increasing the interaction, um, you see that the correlations are starting to leak outside of the light cone uh, until at a very strong interaction, you know, um, you're completely out, out of the light cone. Even more if you um, compute the spreading of correlations for derivative fields. Uh, so, uh, so if you take your observables to be derivative fields, then you see that basically you get non-decaying uh, correlations uh, on top of the, you know, outside of the light cone, on top of the light cone spreading of correlations, um, uh, which, uh, which you would normally um, um, expect. So we observe that uh, numerically. Um, and uh, and first we thought that that must be some uh, problem of the code. It must be some artifact, uh, and we wanted to understand that a bit better. And we actually found um, a way to understand that uh, analytically. Um, so um, the solution comes basically um, through an example of uh, duality in quantum field theory. And uh, Sayantan, you are doing ADS CFT, right? Um, yeah, like. <laughs> that direction. Uh, you are right. Yeah. So right. So okay. So the duality that we use here is a much more simple one than the ADCFT. Um, you know the sort of um, as you very well know the the duality is you know one of the central topics in quantum field theory these days. Um, and you know um, the discovery of ADCFT really uh, dramatically uh, changed our way of understanding. Uh, QFT and, and, and the nature. Um, but the idea of duality is uh, even older and um, uh, people started to look for, for dualities um, even a few decades uh, earlier. Um, the idea is, you know, um, can you actually find some nonlinear mapping of one quantum field theory to a different quantum field theory um, such that this can perhaps help you solve um, uh, solve your problem, which is otherwise uh, uh, hard. And optimally, um, you would have a strongly interacting theory on one side and a weakly interacting theory um, on the other side. Um, and of course, then you know you're hoping to to use some of the techniques on the weakly interacting side to get some understanding of the strongly interacting uh, side. Um, and uh, the duality that we use is a much simpler one than the ADS CFT. Um, and it's also a much older one. Um, interestingly, it was discovered in parallel uh, in the high energy and the condensed matter communities. So both communities came, uh, sort of discovered uh, it with their own means and through different, uh, through different ways. Um, so it holds in dimension one plus one. Um, and it's basically an equivalence between fermions and bosons uh, in dimension one. Um, so you can, my sort of favorite approach is the constructive bosonization one where you can actually rigorously pr prove the equivalence between Hilbert spaces and all the op operators and so on. So you basically construct uh, an exact, uh, uh, an exact uh, duality. So um, in contrast to ADS-CFT, uh, um, you know, this has the advantage that you can actually go and prove it. Of course, it's a much simpler one. So um, it's nothing like proving the ads CFT conjecture. Um, uh, right. And it gives also a nice intuitive understanding, basically brought forward by Coleman, um, that uh, a soliton uh, is basically uh, a fermion. So it has fermi fermionic nature um, and, and the, the, the solitons of, of this in particular San Gordon model, and they behave as, uh, as fermions. They obey the same statistics. Um, right. Um, so if you... Yeah, so I, just, I just want to comment on the previous last slide. Uh, like there, there is another example. I, I actually did one calculation, which is like Chan Simon's matter theories in three dimension, where you mm -hmm. can exactly show this boost fermi duality in very easiest way. Uh, like mm -hmm. it, it is one of the good examples. So I usually call not to prefer it CFT, but rather than some ADS condensed matter theory connection. Some people call it ADS mm -hmm. CMT or something like that. I would be actually very interested. Um, maybe we can discuss at the end of my 
talk because um, so the results that I have, um, I would be very keen on generalizing them to higher dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, it would be very nice if uh, if uh, if one could use that. So if you have some time uh, later after the talk, I mean, uh, sure, I would sure. be very very happy to discuss. Sure. Cool. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I, I was asking quite a few people, and uh, like nobody like pointed it out for the until uh, until now. Um, Cool. Okay, so you know, uh, if you apply bosonization to the San Gordon model, um, then basically you get the fermionic theory, which is the massive Turing model. So this is basically just um, the uh, the free fermion plus a quartic interaction between the fermion fields, um, and um, and this is the um, the relation between the uh, the interaction parameters. So beta is the San Gordon interaction parameter and G is the, the Turing uh, interaction. Um, in particular, if you set beta to this particular to this special value of square root of four pi, um, then the um, uh, the Turing interaction vanishes and you get a free fermion model. So there's a free fermion line here on the uh, on the diagram. So um, we thought, okay, let's see if uh, we can use this duality to to actually Understand analytically the our numerical observation, um, and uh, sort of um, the way you do it is you take your sine Gordon t, um, you take your observables, and you take your initial state. You fermionize them. Um, you you go to the free fermion point where you where it's trivial to compute the dynamics. So you compute the dynamics there, um, um, and then of course um, uh, to you know. So it's easy to compute the propagator, um, but you know your observable now becomes uh, your you know your observable becomes an expression of fermionic field, um, and so you have to compute um, the values of this ob uh, observable on your initial state, which is a bosonic state, and so this gives you um, um, basically an expression of some uh, vertex operators on the initial state that you want to um, compute. Um, and when you put everything together, you get the analytical solution. You basically uh, confirm, uh, you, you find the effect, which, which we observed numerically. So you, you indeed confirm that you, you get uh, non-decaying correlations. They, they actually turn out to be infinite range outside of the light cone um, at finite uh, times. Um, but uh, of course, um, you know, now the interesting question is how can we understand that? And, and what's, the, uh, what's the interpretation uh, of what happens and how can this even happen? So, first, the first question immediately uh, uh, that comes out is: um, Okay, is there something wrong? Uh, is this violating relativity? Um, the answer is um, no. This is not violating relativity. Uh, it's perfectly, um, uh, perfectly agreed. I mean, it's, it perfectly obeys relativity um, because basically because this uh, the the you know the propagator that you use um, to compute your uh, solution. Um, is a strictly causal one. So uh, the dynamics basically uh, um, obeys the uh, relativity the whole time. Um, where the effect comes from uh, mathematically um, are the initial correlation functions. Um, so if you compute the four point uh, correlation functions of chiral fermion fields, so in this case, um, these are fermion fields, uh, with, with, so these are chiral fermion fields. Um, then basically you see that the, by super selection rules, you only have uh, six allowed terms, where uh, two of them, the ones with, which have the chiralities mixed in such an interesting, I mean, in this particular way, um, violate the clustering uh, decomposition. So they basically um, the four point function does not um, cluster into product of two point uh, functions if you go to um, to infinite, oh, where did I go? Uh, to to if you take them infinitely apart, um, and so that's where effect comes from. So basically, um, the effect is so um, the effect is essentially uh, so the, the interpretation is that the effect is essentially already there in the initial state, um, but you know um, it's it doesn't contribute to any bosonic uh, observable. So now at this point, let me be a bit more precise of what are the states that we take, right? So um, we take the initial state to just be the at t equals zero, but they are mixed in with non-linear non sine Gordon dynamics um, at later times. And so, um, so such 
such correlators violating clustering, uh, they're hidden at t equals zero, but then they're uh, uncovered by dynamics at, at later times. So in a way, um, the violation is already there in the initial state, just it's not visible in the bosonic uh, observables. Um, and the sort of interpretation is that um, when you do a quench in a theory which has topological particles, uh, meaning that you know you, you have um, uh, particles with, with some non-trivial uh, uh, winding number, um, then uh, the quench is going to um, entangle um, such uh, particles. In this case, you know you can interpret this correlator uh, as two pairs, two soliton anti-soliton uh, pairs. And then, um, uh, I mean, I, pre I uh, presented this once to a high high energy audience, and of course, uh, and the reaction was, um, of course, I mean, um, uh, you know, this should be expected, right? If you do a global quench, then of course it's probably expected that it will introduce some uh, correlation, some entanglement to the system, um, um, and. Um, uh, and indeed, yes. So if you want to, if you want to do a global quench, means that you have to change simultaneously an interaction parameter throughout uh, the system, right? So um, a protocol which is much more um, sort of uh, common in the uh, condensed matter setting, where we are used to, you know, we can take our experiment and we can just change some uh, some laser or change some magnetic field, and we're going to get a quench. Um, becomes much more. Um, much more exotic even in the high energy setting where it's not so easy to, to engineer a, a quench. Um, so basically this, this effect is not to be understood as super luminal transport, but rather it's a way of generating entanglement and correlation in QFT through, through quenches. So now we know that you know, if you have a quench in, uh, in, in a QFT with, that has some non-trivial topology of the fields, um, then uh, you are going to you're going to generate correlation. Uh, you're going to generate infinite range correlation through such an effect. Um, so I have a question. So uh, what exact protocol uh, people have used to establish this idea? Because in quench, you uh, prefer to consider some kind of uh, some either slowly or maybe sign, uh, like some kind of uh, instantaneous transition in the parameters of the Hamiltonian. So what type of protocol people have used exactly for as a model? Uh, you mean uh, normally when studying, we're studying questions or, uh, or here in this particular case? Oh, okay. Uh, right, so in this particular case, um, we start with the, uh, with the ground state of the Clan gordon theory. And then at time equals zero, we abruptly uh, switch on the sine gordon interaction. So, so, so here it's an instantaneous change. Okay, okay. Um, so, like, but you can, you know, in general, you can also do um, what is called slow quenches, yes. where instead of um, switching something instantaneously, you do a, a gradual transition. No, that, that's why I'm asking because probably you have used, I, I believe that you have used kind of heavy side theta. Yes, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, the reason for that is just because um, that's easier to compute in this particular yeah, yeah, case. It's very easy. If you go for some other protocol, it is not maybe always uh, like, maybe you can't be able to derive the analytical results. Yeah, no, for sure not. I mean, um, because, you know, here we rely on the fact that you go basically immediately to the free fermion point of the model. But if you wanted to go, for example, you know, through all the points in between, then your system is basically, you know, uh, a strongly interacting one, um, which you know you can't serve, you can't solve perturbatively, and you can't use integrability basically to compute these correlation functions simply because you know it's not doable yet. So, so it could be very hard to do it. Um, of course, we could do it numerically, and that actually still remains to be done. Um, so numerically, one could probably study quenches which are more um, more gradual. So where you you could have some smooth um, uh, smooth dynamics uh, of your inter uh, interaction parameters. So yeah, numerically is doable. Um, um, yeah, um, right. Uh, so that's kind of the intuitive picture, right? So at time t equals zero minus epsilon, we have uh, exponentially decaying correlations. At time t equals 
quench in our Hamiltonian, we go from Klein Gordon to zero plus epsilon. This introduces the correlation between the solitons and anti solitons. So, uh, in particular, I'm here I'm using the, the classical sort of picture of, uh, of the solitons just for, for the graphic um, presentation. Um, so, basically, you introduce some correlation that violates clustering. Um, and then, but you know, this is not yet visible in local bosonic observables. Um, but at later times, the dynamics of the system mixes this type of correlators into the local observables, and you get this oscillating, uh, um, oscillating correlations in time. So that's the picture. Um, and um, you know, uh, having uh, having observed that and having uh, uh, got the understanding that um, the effect comes through the existence of uh, the solitons. Uh, of the uh, topological particles of the of the theory, um, we sort of uh, conjectured that the effect should be there in all QFTs with non-trivial uh, compactifications of the fields, and it's not just a very exotic property of the San Gordon model. Um, and in particular, um, I was interested, um, uh, you know, whether the effect occurs in gauge field theory, because then, of course, one could also expect that there could be some trace of it in the, you know. Um, in the standard model, or that you know maybe one could uh, find some uh, observable uh, prediction of of such an effect, um, and so um, so then I focused on the simplest example of uh, a gauge field theory, which is the Schwinger model, so the quantum electrodynamics in dimension one. Um, that's just because um, this theory is on one side well understood, um, uh, the massless version. <coughs> so if, if you put bare mass to zero, is uh, solvable. Um, that that was done already by Schwinger. Um, and, uh, you can you know it's um, you probably know uh, at least the, uh, the the high energy part of the of the audience. Um, it was studied uh, as an example of a. Because it has confinement, so it's like one of the toy models to study uh, to study confinement um, and um, uh, and string breaking and so on. Uh, and it has um, a rich spectrum where the um, um, the number of mesons that appear in the theory depends on the uh, on the values of the model uh, parameters. Um, so I studied this model numerically because in this case. Um, uh, apart, you know, um, the the quenches from the massless to the massless uh, Schwinger model are just the Klein Gordon quenches where the uh, there is no horizon violation effect that's easy to prove. Um, and for the, the massive, I mean, the massive theory is not integrable, so I studied it numerically. Um, and I found that um, indeed also this theory has the uh, horizon violation effect um, for. Um, for the correlators of the uh, of the fermion currents, uh, so that's basically uh, what you uh, what you see, and the quenches are there both in the uh, I mean the, the effect is there both in quenches of the um, of the uh, mass uh, uh, to uh, charge ratio, which is one of the parameters, and in the um, uh, the theta parameter. So that's the background field of the of the model. So the, the model turns out to have a um, um, a, a background field, um, and if you look at the, if you study the frequency of these um, of the oscillations, that you you see that is related to uh, twice the mass of the uh, of the lightest meson uh, that appears in the theory. So again, the sort of um, intuition is that um, when uh, when you do a quench, you basically couple uh, four electrons anti electrons. Which in this case are you know they appear in bound states, which are the mesons. So you basically uh, in, you basically um, correlate pairs of mesons when you do uh, a quench, and indeed you can also find a cluster violation in this uh, model. Um, it has been known that uh, the massless Schwinger model has a cluster violation for the vertex operators or or uh, for chiral chiral fermions, and um, and uh, it's also there in the mass. So. Uh, observe that is also there in the massive case. Um, so, in particular, through the Schwinger model, um, you know, uh, our results are also linked to the already 
uh, known results that um, there is this particular um, violation of uh, chiral fermion density as in the Schinger uh, model. And it is understood that this uh, is a consequence of the, um, of the degenerate vacua. So the models that have um, degenerate vacua uh, then are gonna have this type of cluster uh, violations. Um, right, so here I would uh, like to conclude. Um, basically, there are many, um, since this is still very recent, there are many open questions um, that appear, that uh, emerge from the, uh, from this cluster violation, I mean, uh, from this horizon violation. Um, many people ask, um, can you observe something like that in lattices? Um, most likely not, because if you combine the Lip Robinson theorems with the Araki theorems, so the Lip Robinson theorems basically tell you that the correlations are going to spread with, uh, within the light cone if the initial state satisfies clustering. And the Araki theorem tells you that um, uh, local interacting Hamiltonians, uh, their thermal states are going to have uh, clustering. So if you combine those two, they're very prohibitive. And for the lattice, um, uh, one, shouldn't, one wouldn't expect to observe such an effect. And then it's interesting because, you know, um, in field theory, uh, we have some effect which doesn't occur on the lattice. Uh, and that's interesting because it's pointing that there could be actually some fundamental uh, difference between continuous and, and discrete systems. Um, uh, and, you know, namely um, on the lattice, you can rotate neighboring lattice sites arbitrarily, and that get, just gives you a finite uh, penalty in the energy. While in field theory, the neighboring degrees of freedom are basically, you know, uh, infinitesimally close to each other. So if you you know if you if you do a, a huge change that's gonna cost you that's gonna basically cost you an infinite penalty in the in the energy right so there, it could be that, they, that there's some fundamental difference well the, the effect is pointing to some fundamental difference however still being more pragmatic it would be interesting to understand what, which of the um, properties of the lattice systems you need to violate in order to observe such an effect. Um, and, you know, in, um, in field theory, we understand that it comes from this global super, super selection rules introduced by topology. And so the question is if in the lattice you introduce some, you know, if you introduce some suitable global super selection rules, can you, can you have such um, an effect? What I'm very interested in would be generalizations be beyond the dimension one plus one. So, Sayantan, I mean, like, that's why um, I'm really uh, excited about your comment that you made. Um, and in particular, also to higher gauge theory, so beyond um, QED. Um, and of course, then there are different questions like what happens to the entanglement entropy dynamics? Um, can we observe it experimentally? We are already communicating with the, with the group that I showed the, with the experiments from that they do these experiments for QFT. So they're trying to measure it. Um, does such an effect equilibrate? At, at this point, we understand that yes, I mean, it probably does equilibrate. Um, and, um, and, you know, finally, are there any, you know, interesting applications to condensed matter, condense matter physics or, you know, high energy physics, in particular cosmology, something that, you know, you could measure or that you could say that has some, you know, uh, important effect or some relevant effect for the nature. And, you know, just as a teaser, um, you could imagine in cosmology this uh, toy model. So you have uh, a Big Bang created universe, um, which uh, creates um, the initial state where uh, an anisotropic initial state. So um, the, uh, the initial electric field is not zero, but it, it has some preferred direction. And so, you know, this could be possible just because, you know, the uh, isotropic case is just a very fine-tuned uh, would be a very fine-tuned value. So you know why would the why would the Big Bang choose a fine-tuned uh, value? So then you know if you do this in dimension one plus one, the electric field uh, is stable um, and uh, and nothing's going to happen. But if you do it in dimension um, uh, uh, four, so dimension three plus one, um, then the electric field is going to decay very rapidly through the um, through the vacu vacuum breakdown. Um, basically, you're going to have uh, um, creation of pairs, which is going to um, dissolve the initial electric field. And so basically, 
what in this case what would happen you would have a, a quench from a non-zero value of the electric field to, to a zero value of the electric field um, and then of course if this effect was also present in higher dimension um, such a quench would then cause um, uh, would then cause correlation between uh, between electron currents and this would be a, a, a long distance correlation well an infinite distance uh, correlation so then it's interesting to ask um, can you observe some uh, you know can, so can you this, come up with some this exact point we actually have uh, posted two weeks ago in archive uh, the, the, so similar kind of thing we, we have said in three plus one dimension and we said that this anisotropy usually people consider a isotropic model in cosmology and uh, we, we we have said that Maybe this anisotropy is basically not the perturbations, but it is basically some kind of quantum fluctuations, like maybe some quantum Brownian motion or something happening very early universe. And because mm -hmm. of that, some anisotropy is generating. And uh, then we have studied this possibility of having quantum sequence in three plus one dimension. And then we That's studied thermalization procedure and uh, yeah, like your uh, also this whether Gibbs generalized Gibbs and ensemble uh, uh, basically thermalizes the system or not and what will going to happen before quench or after quench or just before thermalization we have studied all these possibilities recently okay very interesting okay no I would be I would be interested to hear more about this um, so like Either you know in a discussion, maybe the best the best uh, thing yeah, would be yeah. that I first uh, read your paper, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am available anytime. You can actually we can discuss. Even I have a talk on this issue on uh, Thursday mm -hmm. at. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Cool. Yeah. So uh, at the University right. of Groningen, I will share the Zoom link with you. Maybe mm -hmm. you can actually listen to that talk. That might be. Yeah, good. I think that's the best. Yeah, that's probably the best, right? Um, yeah. Okay, great. What time is it? Just uh, I hope it is the same time when it your talk. The same time. time. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I think I'm available at that time on Thursday. Okay, oh, great. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I'll be very happy if you send me the link uh, via email, um, and uh, yeah, and then I will attend. Um, and then maybe sometime later we can also discuss. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About, I'm, very, uh, I'm very much interested because. Like uh, the issues you have pointed, like it's really interesting, particularly the extension for this kind of thing for higher dimensions, like the bosonization problem. It's mm -hmm. really, really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I, I can say that few possibilities only have studied, but there are a lot of things to do. People have it mm -hmm. considered. So, so you use bosonization to basically uh, to compute things. Yeah, so that's a separate project, but yeah, so like that we did for uh, two plus one dimensional Chan Simons theories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the similar kind of thing you can say the Schwinger model that you have considered, it is like it, uh, we have some kind of gauge field, which is like you know that how the Chan Simons gauge fields looks like. Along with that, it is interacting with matter. Now we. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of matter you prefer? As this is according to you. Maybe you can consider scalar fields or fermions or something like that. Now, this interaction between this gauge field and these matter fields are very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and this is this is basically kind of S U N rank K mm -hmm. theory. Okay, S U N sorry S U N rank K theory, which is uh, included with uh, connected with the etu coupling. Mm -hmm. This K is basically n by lambda n is the number of degrees of freedom and by lambda is the eto coupling so you can actually mm -hmm. study these theories at the strong coupling limit as well as in the weak coupling limit as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. super cool I'm, I'm really excited um as, as i said like I, I talked with a few people and i was asking them like uh you know can something be done in higher dimension? Everybody says it's difficult. Um, and so it's it's really great to have such a candidate. 
yeah three, oh. three plus one dimension uh, sorry the two plus one dimension this is quite a very uh, uh, I, I have to say like people have done many work on that uh, there are lots of paper written by Shiraz Minwala Shiraz Minwala Ofer Aharoni and uh -huh. uh, uh, Nathan Cyber from IS Princeton uh, regarding this duality so I, I have just said about one class of model. If you look, in, I can actually share with some references. You will see that there are plenty of classes which you consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this Cyborg's uh, paper was actually talking about the possibilities, but they haven't studied the correlations, the outcomes and all. But yeah, like those are the things, so as you are asking that what are the possibilities? So there are possibilities, a lot of possibilities. So th that's why I'm saying people can do a lot of work on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Okay, super cool. I mean, I would be really, really happy if you send me all these references and yeah. so I can have a look at them and then then like we can discuss um, when I, you know, sure. uh, reach some sufficient background in uh, uh, or, you know, just have an overview of, uh, of this. That would be really great. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm really, really happy, you know, because like mostly I communicate with more of the condensed matter uh, community and, you know, then um, people do st stuff in one plus one D and so on. Um, and uh, so, yeah. No, actually, so I, I actually connected with your talk much because uh, you have actually said three, four things which I usually do for uh, higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I actually connect with whatever you are saying, uh, but yeah, I, I, I didn't do it for one plus one dimension. I, uh, one another possibility, I don't know, like you have studied this thing or not, because this thing these days are very important for the EDS community, which is SYK model or tensor. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so that that is one of the examples, even in lower dimension, but it is like I have to say, like very very successful model. Okay, so yeah. you want to speak more? No, I think I'm done with what I wanted to say. And so uh, we can, you know, if there's more questions or, you know, if uh, yeah, we want to debate that, on and so on. Before that, I will request all the participants to unmute yourself, give a clap for Ivan for giving such an interesting talk, and then please continue the, with the questions. And uh, yeah, I feel that he's very tired, but I will not go, go with infinite number of questions, but yeah, <laughs> very, very, really important questions. Uh, yeah, please uh, unmute yourself and give a clap for him. Thanks a lot. Actually, yeah. it's so nice. I think I haven't got a real applause in a long time because all these talks are online now. So you don't even, you know, uh, <laughs> There, there is no good way of applauding, so that's that really feels nice. No, the talk was really nice. I, I have to say, this is like a great overview I have, and I'm very happy that after a long time, somebody has given a great overview, particularly this non equilibrium side, because there are lots of uh, ideas, lots of models, lots of things are going on, and uh, clubbing all them together. Uh, in a talk, in a single talk, it's I like very difficult, but you managed to do so. That's that. That's why, like, I have to say, this is very nice. Yeah, it can easily try to be too broad, right? If one to tries to to, yes. to 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 put all these things in a single talk, I was wondering, like, am I maybe trying to put too many different things in a single talk? But uh, yeah, yeah so I decided now, to give it a try. If the people have any question, please, Johannes, you have any question? Obishek, Nilesh, please, please ask questions. I have, I have one, yeah. I have one question, sir. Uh, I do not know sure how correct I am, but like, since the Lagrangian, you are considering all the relativistic invariant, like, then why is I, mean, I didn't understand the case. Like, it's the correlation is coming out of the uh, light cone. Like, uh, mm -hmm. could you like, uh, exp like, the, I, all the Lagrangians are like, <laughs> relativistic invariant, but why are we getting the correlation? coming out of the light code. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, yeah. um, 
so I'm gonna um, so this is a good question. I'm gonna try to um, answer um, at the very mathematical level because that's probably or you know the technical level because that's probably the best way to to understand it. Um, so if you write down the the solution for these time dependent correlations, then you see that basically it's some convolution um, of uh, Green's functions. So you have basically you know for a product of four Green's functions. And you're convolving that with um, with the correlator um, of the initial uh, on the initial states. So you have a correlator of uh, a product uh, uh, a product of four uh, fermion fields uh, on the initial state. And then you have, uh, of course, you take a sum over all the possible chiralities, all the possible uh, combinations. Um, and so this part with the Green's functions, um, that's you know that's strictly causal. I mean, the Green's function is it's nothing else than the, the very well-known uh, fermionic uh, Green's function, I mean, the fermionic two-point function. So, uh, so, so, you know, there is, there is, there is nothing, uh, nothing uh, unknown here, nothing exotic here. So everything is very well controlled. However, um, these uh, initial correlators, they violate clustering, meaning that, you know, um, if you take, uh, so you can see the picture here. If you take x1 and x2 very far away from y1 and y2, um, then if the correlator was satisfying clustering, um, this um, the whole correlator would decay into a product of uh, two-point functions. So a two-point function between x1 and x2 and the two-point function between y1 and y2. Um, and of course, uh, this, this, this product would then just go to zero, right? So the correlation will just go to zero. However, for a particular combination of, of uh, chiralities, uh, this doesn't happen. And you actually get a non-zero non value of the correlator if you take uh, those two far away. And this is the source of the, the, source of the effect um, mathematically. Um, the interpretation is then, of course, that you have, I mean, it is what, what I said before that you have some entanglement between soliton and desoliton pairs, but mathematically comes from the clustering violation of this uh, chiral uh, chiral fermion fields. Thank you. I, I hope it was clear enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. So I guess wanna... oh, on the next next slide with the mesons uh, in the real real time evolution. Um, so uh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, exactly. So uh, the, these meson frequencies, uh, uh, to, to what visual uh, features do they correspond in your in your uh, plots that you show? All uh, right. So yes. So you um, you computed the frequency of this uh, you know uh, of these uh, violations, and then you compare the frequency with the the mass of the mesons. So it's these horizontal. Um, Line, lines with the frequency. Exactly, yeah, those, those horizontal lines and, you know, they oscillate in time. Uh, so what I do here is I just take a discrete Fourier transform of this, uh, like, you, you know, you, you take the signal at a specific, uh, you, know, you, you take a time series at a specific uh, value of X and you, you do a, a discrete Fourier transform and you get something like this, this black dot. And then on top of that, I plot the, the value of the meson masses which uh, have been computed uh, already in the literature by different methods. Um, and uh, is it uh, uh, it's a lattice effect, I guess, that these uh, uh, oscillations in the, in the middle, so to say, uh, that are recurring, um, like, like this backbone uh, uh, in a sense, uh, that is that a, uh, that it's lattice effect, right? Ah, you mean uh, these, uh, this thing? Yeah, that's uh, those ripples, right, that you see. Yeah, that's a um, that's a truncation effect. So you know, um, to do to do this numerics, you um, you basically just keep the lower part of the Hilbert space, the low energy part of the Hilbert space, and this of course means that you have uh, some uh, finite uh, fin finite finite uh, uh, smallest difference uh, distance. Sorry, some you know some finite uh, largest momentum in your theory, uh, and this you know these ripples correspond. So the, the ripples are an artifact of the method. They correspond to basically, you know, what is the smallest, um, uh, what is the smallest um, uh, resolution that you, you know, the smallest distance in your theory, basically. 
So oh. yes, so that's like that's what you usually get in the in the TCSA method. So if you um, if you increase your cutoff, then uh, then of course these uh, ripples are going to become smaller and smaller. However, the the cost is basically exponential, right? So the the Hilbert space grows exponentially with the with the cutoff. So uh, it's exponentially expensive to to increase the cutoff. So, so a finite bond dimension effect, you, you say, uh, not a lattice effect of uh, minimum uh, lattice spacing? Um, yeah, it's a finite cutoff. So let's see if I have, uh, ah, okay, I also have to acknowledge these two people, which are my collaborators, my, my really nice collaborators. So Gabor Takac from Budapest, who is in particular an expert in integrability in QFT and also these uh, methods for, for QFT numerical methods and Spiros Piriadis, uh, who also worked with John Cardi previously and is an expert in also in non-equilibrium dynamics of, of QFT. Okay, let's see if I have the slide right. Okay, so, um, so you know, um, basically, uh, so, so yeah, in this case, um, the, in the TCSA case, um, the sort of picture is a bit different than uh, the DMRG. So there, there is no bond, there's no notion of bond dimension. So what happens is you go to momentum space um, and you represent, uh, so you represent your uh, interacting Hamiltonian um, in, the, uh, in the Hilbert space uh, of the CFT part. In our case, it's just the free theory, the CFT part. Um, um, and you know that's how the Hilbert space looks like. So it has, uh, different uh, Fermat models, different sectors. And then you basically just introduce a cutoff. So you cut all the states which are above uh, above certain energy. And then why this works, why you can do that, that's basically guaranteed by the RG theory, which tells you that um, the perturbing operator that you had in your Hamiltonian, if it is relevant, then it is not going to mix the low energy and the high energy part of the spectrum. So basically the uh, the the sort of effect of the interaction is basically going to almost preserve the, uh, the the two parts of the of the Hilbert space. There, it's not going to mix them too much. So if you do this, um, if you do such a truncation, you don't commit too much of a crime, let's say. Um, um, and and then your you know such a truncated method, of course, is just an approximation to the uh, to you know to the exact one to the you know infinite I mean infinite Hilbert space. Um, but then it's gonna, you know, uh, reliably reproduce your low, low energy physics. But of course, one of the effects of the truncation is that you know um, uh, you have some maximal momentum mode k max, and your um, your uh, you know smallest distance in in position space that you can resolve is one divided by k max, right? So this basically introduces those uh, those ripples there, right? And then. Uh, you know, if the truncation is uh, is smaller, then the ripple the ripples are worse. If the truncation, if you can reach larger truncation, then the ripples are better. Um, uh, I see. Yeah. So yeah, I, I missed that you uh, calculate that with um, truncated conformal space approach. Um, uh, I thought with tensor networks, then I guess it would have correspond to the lattice effect, which is kind of uh, similar with. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, I was not, you know. Uh, uh, so technical. I mean, I didn't give enough technical details so that you could actually follow because I just didn't want to overburden the talk with uh, uh, with two technicalities. So um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's actually an interesting question whether you could uh, compute that with uh, with tensor networks, right? So because you know it goes to the question: Can you see it in lattice systems? Uh, can one find an example that will be extremely interesting? Uh, so the question is, you know. Uh, what are what are the the properties that the model that you take would have to have? Would it have to have um, uh, an infinite local Hilbert space dimension? Because we know that for uh, you know for finite local Hilbert space dimension, then um, the Lipinson bound is is prohibitive. Uh, or you know if you introduce some global properties such that you have some global super super selection rules, so that your system is not just exactly locally interacting, but it has some sort of a some sort of a long range interaction. So what is the what is the minimal requirement to have this on the um, on the lattice side? Mm. But yeah, what concerns the TCSA methods, so the truncated conformal space approach, 
Um, the original application is um, people were mostly computing spectral properties, right? So everything you everything you were computing, everything people would be computing would be in momentum space. So you never went back to the to the position space. And only recently we started using them also for computing correlation functions. Um, and that actually turned out to be exact. I mean, the, the motivation to do that came from the experiment because we tried to uh, to compute some some things that were observed in the experiment and so on to study non-Gaussianity of correlation functions and so on. But then it turned out that you know um, although you have a, a finite basically resolution with such a method because the method is more tailored to, to applications in momentum space, um, you can still you know use it and and get some uh, I mean get some notion of the dynamics and compute some dynamical properties. Um, in case of computing one point functions, um, you can reach a, a a much much higher precision too um so but yeah in general the methods are going to perform better if you if you use them for a spectral properties than for the position space properties any other question um if not then uh, thank you ivan for your time and I believe that you are very tired right now. It is almost two hours. <laughs> but yeah, but I will surely meet with you. Uh, like uh, I will send the link and the references that you are asking for. And uh, then we will discuss surely about this. Okay, thank you very much. And also I imagine for you guys is even later in the, in the evening. So, so yeah, also wish you everybody a nice evening. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to, to discussing with you. Yeah, and stay safe and healthy. That's more, most important. And uh, thanks. Yeah. So see you soon. I will uh, you contact soon. you. Okay. And once this okay. talk will be uploaded, I will share the link with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. And really looking forward. See you. Bye. Bye bye.